Hello, YouTube. Have you ever tried to eat drywall as a child? No? You haven't? Only me, I guess? Well, I mean, now that I think of it, that does explain why it turned out this way. But don't worry, with today's setups and some bad cleaning, you'll get the chance to turn out just like me. Now, internet, I must say I've been desperate to get a molecule which contains sulfur. Going with experimenting with anything which contains sulfur, even going as far as to trying to extract it from a piece of pyrite like this. But yesterday I figured something out. I figured out how to get what I want from what I have. That's right, internet. Today we'll be dissolving a literal piece of my wall to make sulfuric acid out of it. Now as to how I came up with this, I'm still baffled. Maybe it was the lack of better things to do, or maybe it was the man inside of the walls giving me this idea. Unscrew and throw out every screw in the house. What? No. Ugh. Mail your friend's dog to Cuba. Give me a normal idea for once. Make sulfuric acid out of your drywall. Yeah, that works. But don't worry, Internet. Today we're gonna get him out and make sulfuric acid in the process. Regardless of how this idea came to mind, drywall, as it turns out, is made of gypsum, and for me, who has been trying to make sulfuric acid for ages, nothing could be more valuable. Okay, so the process this time is actually mildly annoying, because calcium sulfate is unbelievably stable and not water soluble. We need to somehow figure out how to yank the sulfate out. Well, originally I was thinking of dissolving it in acid, but then I came to realize that calcium sulfate is also not soluble in acid. Unless you get an acid stronger than the sulfuric, but that's really not happening. So, to dissolve this piece of calcium sulfate, what we'll need is flesh-eating chemicals. Yeah, just some anion plus carbonate, and that should probably do it. Okay, so the first step in making the flesh eating solution is to get sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate can be gotten from basically burning baking soda and then decomposing it. As we have unlimited gypsum from the accident, which happened at the local crackhead's house, we need to decide on a random amount of sodium bicarbonate which we're going to sacrifice. And just like... Perfect. Okay, as we have approximately 69 grams of baking soda, we can expect these 69 grams to turn into slightly over 40 grams of sodium carbonate. And now we just need to cook. Yeah, any heat. They don't quite give out instructions how to do this. So as long as it heats up over 100 degrees, it's fine. Okay, I've waited about 10 minutes. That's usually enough for this reaction. So now we can turn this thing off and we can actually do this. And as you can see, steam rises up. The steam is from the water which evaporated from within. And if you take a look at the grain size, you can see that it is... The grains are much bigger. That's proof that the reaction is done. Now that we have finished making the sodium carbonate, let's figure out what its weight is. So we put it on the scale and we get... 46 grams. That's roughly good enough. That shows us that the reaction is done. Now, the only thing which we need to do is drain the crackhead's garbage bin and turn the gypsum into so calcium sulfate. Okay, so the next step is, is to set the drywall up itself. Ideally, you want to use the porous part like this, not its front or its back, as doing this process with either of those or release toxic fumes. However, if you've been a fan of the channel, you should know that I don't really care about them. Ideally, you want to crush the drywall up into as small bits as you can, because this reaction will yield an insoluble product, meaning that, well, basically you just want the particles as small as possible, or else it will be not as effective. Okay, sure, yeah, let's dump the crushed drywall into something which we eat out of, so we can get the true drywall nanoparticle eating experience, and it weighs 24 grams. 
Okay, so I know the stoichiometry here is wrong. Ideally, you want a one-to-one -one ratio of weight between the baking soda and the drywall itself, but I didn't bother calculating stoichiometry here for two reasons. The first reason being is that I do not like stoichiometry. The second one being is that this reaction is reversible, meaning that regardless of which, it will reach an equilibrium, and not all of the drywall and not all of the baking soda will be consumed. So if you want to optimize in terms of drywall, just add more baking soda. Now that we have crushed gypsum, we need to convert it to crushed calcium sulfate. This can be done by boiling it. Surprisingly, I thought that getting rid of the dihydrate would be quite annoying. But no, it's just heating it up to 100 degrees, waiting for the water to evaporate off. So we heat it, and you should be able to see some smoke rising up. Okay, so before this process goes any further, I need to warn you that the resin on the front and back will release toxic fumes if you burn it. So make sure, make sure you get rid of all of it, and do it in a very well-ventilated place. Yeah, it looks ventilated. Okay, now that I've been burning this for approximately 15 minutes, let's pour it back in and let's see what turned out. So we got about 20 grams of calcium sulfate, which roughly equates to the rate shown on screen right about here. So what do you know what the man in my walls wasn't lying? Drywall really is made out of gypsum. Okay, so the next step is to mix these two things together. Because baking soda is soluble, we can dissolve it inside of water. Use roughly as much water as will dissolve the amount of sodium carbonate which you have. And apparently we needed more water, so yeah, we just mix this thing together and... That was unexpected. I'm guessing some of the sodium bicarbonates and fully decomposed, but that doesn't really matter. That would just make it a bit slower. But either ways, yeah, um, all of this stuff, all of this precipitate, it will sink down to the bottom in a second. Although it is bubbling now, it makes real no importance if it bubbles or not, so if yours doesn't bubble, it's fine. Okay, regardless of where it's bubbling, over the precipitate should sink down to the bottom. The precipitate being composed of two bits, the calcium carbonate formed, and the calcium sulfate, which I just dumped in there. Because the calcium carbonate is lighter than the calcium sulfate, it will float up to the top of the precipitate layer, and the calcium sulfate will sink. However, we want the calcium sulfate to be on the top, we want it to be touching the liquid as much as possible. So remember to mix it around occasionally. Okay, so this reaction is pretty fast as it is, like most of it's already reacted. Just to improve in efficiency in terms of reactions, um, leave it like this for a few hours, mix it occasionally, and then repeat the process in terms of mixing it and leaving it. I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna get back to you after a few hours. Okay, so we waited a day, mixing it occasionally, and this is what turned out. For some reason, it became orange. Why does everything keep becoming orange? <laughs> The precipitate and the liquid have separated, and now it smells like a freshly cleaned oven in which something got set on fire a few minutes beforehand. I'm guessing that's due to the baking soda obliterating any organic matter which accidentally got in there. If you look at this thing, you can see the precipitate has become much wider than what soaked drywall looks like. This is due to it all becoming calcium carbonate, or for the most part. Okay, now that we separated the orange juice, and the precipitate, we basically managed to straight up pull out, rip out the sulfate ions right out of the drywall and into this cup. On second thought, I probably shouldn't have put such a yellowish liquid into something which literally contains peach juice. Uh, yeah, that's probably a safety hazard. While I was actually developing this process, I was wondering how can I test it out at various points in time. And one of the things that I came up with is that when the calcium sulfate reacts with the sodium carbonate, it becomes calcium carbonate, and that is actually soluble in acid. Okay, so I literally ran out of vinegar on this step. However, it seems that all of the calcium carbonate has been dissolved for the most part. So, in a while, once all of the bubbling stops, you should be able to see all of the calcium sulfate, which then reacted at the bottom. 
Alright, so as you can see, the precipitate kind of settled down. From the original 50 milliliters which we had, we have now about 20. That means that 30 milliliters of the precipitate was calcium carbonate. That means that the calcium, when turned into calcium carbonate, and the sulfate is now floating around inside of this jar. Alright, so I was going to make this a two-part video, but then I realized that's a coward's way out. So we're just going to do it all in one video. So what we're doing now is just boiling the solution to concentrate it as much as I can to make it as easy to work with as possible. Wow, this is the third time I boil something in one video. That's rare. Maybe I should start a cooking show at this rate. <laughs> no. Amusingly, while coming up with this process, I tried mixing this solution with acid and then boiling it off. Naturally, this dissolved my pan. So yeah, kids, don't boil hydrochloric acid. And now that all of the water has evaporated, leaving only the salts behind, I'll wait for this thing to cool down, and then I'll dissolve this in the exact amount of water needed, so that it, the solution is perfectly saturated. So the best way to recover acid from salt is via electrolysis. Here's the good old electrolysis setup, which you all have seen many times. Small difference with the setup though, I'll make the cathode as concentrated as possible, and the anode as least concentrated as possible. So I'm gonna pour nearly everything out, except I'm gonna save, like, a drop of the solution. And I'm gonna pour the drop over here. Next, I'm going to pour water in both of these to balance the pressure out. And for the anodes and cathodes, for the electrodes, for the anode I'm going to use iron, for a reason I'm going to explain later. And for the cathode you can use any metal. For the cathode I'm just going to use this copper chain, because I really don't need it. If I made the concentrations equal here and here, there would be a lot of sodium carbonate. So over the sulfate ions which flow here, instead of just being collected, they just react with the sodium carbonate, making the process much longer, basically. The reason I have this iron anode instead of a graphite one is that so all of the sulfate which flows here reacts with the iron, making iron sulfate, which is soluble, and all of the carbonate reacts with the iron, making iron carbonate making it insoluble, so the solution will only contain iron sulfate and over the carbonate will precipitate down to the However, bottom. However, if I had the same concentration here and here, that would make all of the sulfate react with the sodium ions, um, making both carbonate and sulfate suspended inside of the solution. So in a way we're filtering it this way, it's kind of like one-sided electrolysis. So now I'll turn this electrolysis setup on, and as you can see the voltage is at 13 volts. This is the current. Current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. So just remember it for now. Immediately you can see what was on both sides. Here hydrogen will be released on the negative side, and on the positive side there will also be bubbles. That's carbon dioxide flowing out of the system. So as you can see the current is going up. That means the resistance is going down because I didn't touch the voltage. What this means is that there is more water soluble salts floating around, easing the flow of electricity. This means that iron sulfate is actually being formed right over here right now. It can't be the iron hydroxide and it can't be the iron carbonate because both of these salts are insoluble and they would sink down to the bottom and not affect the uh, resistance at all. So because the current is going up, that means the amount of heat generated is also going up every second. So that means that you should probably check on this thing every half an hour or so. At least I do, because these CO's made of hot glue might melt and the whole thing might spill out everywhere. You can see a few chunks floating around. If you look carefully, you can also see that they're green. That's the iron 2 carbonate, which is actually green in color, and it's insoluble, so hence the chunks. Alright, so I'll leave this thing like this for a few hours and I'll get back to you after that. Alright, so I left this thing running for about 5 hours, and as you can see this cup it became completely green. That's because iron 2 salts are green. And if you look at it, there's not just precipitate, the solution itself is also green. What this means is that there's actually no carbonate ions floating around in here, and only sulfate ions. Okay, so this is what I got. I'll just leave this thing until the precipitate settles. By the way, I must mention it actually looks strangely delicious. But yeah, I'll leave this thing until the precipitate settles. By the way, um, it can be either orange, green, or brown. The both the solution and the precipitate. The color just depends off the voltage and the concentration. So it can be either of those.
Okay, so I was originally planning to get the precipitator over here to settle down, but now I realize there's really no point in that, because we'd be basically electrolyzing the solution. The precipitate won't be involved in the electrolysis, so the precipitate just won't get pulled to the other side in the one-way electrolysis. So yeah, the exact same setup. Um, but nearly pure water on the anode side, and the solution on the cathode side. So I'm gonna pour the solution over here, And I'm going to pour like a drop of it over here. And then I'm going to basically turn on the electrolyzer. So copper electrode over here and a graphite one right over here. Maybe I might need some more water for this thing. Yeah, graphite one on this side, copper on here. I'd also cover the anode side with uh, wrapping paper or food wrapping, just because it might release sulfur trioxide fumes, theoretically. It shouldn't, but it might, so just do that. Okay, so yeah, just turn the power supply on, and the sulfate ion should start flowing from this side to this side, and react with the anode just to make regular sulfuric acid. The current shouldn't change much, that's because there's no new ions being produced. The sulfur is just being dragged from here to here, and the iron is just being coated onto the copper electrode. So now I'm just going to leave this strangely drinkable looking solution being electrolyzed for a few hours. I'll return to you after that. Alright, so I left this thing sitting for about a day and I came back to the anode being completely corroded. So as you can see, there are zero amperes. Why is there zero amperes? Because the anode just doesn't reach the water anymore. Apparently graphite can break down like that. The cathode side, the solution itself has become more yellow. I'm guessing that's just the green precipitate settled down. As for the cathode side, if you would look closely, there isn't any precipitate at the bottom. The precipitate was originally iron carbonate and stuff like that, and I'm guessing the sulfuric acid just obliterated it. However, the solution has become more yellow. Also, as a side effect, the originally copper anode has been electroplated with iron, which was suspended in the solution over here. Alright, bet, let me transfer the contents of the anode side into the micro-microwave to be bathed in UV light like nothing ever should. So hopefully over the sulfur trioxide molecules floating around inside of the water, react with the water under the influence of UV light to become sulfuric acid. And I'm going to leave this thing until morning, or until the flashlight runs out of power, which one ever happens sooner. Alright, so I let the mixture sit in the UV microwave for about a day. I poured it into an Erlen Mayer flask, and I got about 200 milliliters worth of unconcentrated sulfuric acid. So now I'm just going to boil it up because the sulfuric acid can be concentrated via boiling. I'm boiling it in a glass Erlen Mayer flask because if I boiled it in metal, it would melt through the metal and I'd be left with a whole bunch of sulfuric acid on the floor and through the table actually. Oh yeah, by the way, this reaction it releases sulfur trioxide gas. Sulfur trioxide is not only poisonous, it also smells like garbage. So, yeah, do it in a more ventilated place. I don't think I'm gonna get sulfur trioxide because my original concentration is very low, so unless I boil it down to a few drops, it's not gonna start releasing, but yeah, just be warned, guys. So, after the boiling part, you can see that I have slightly under 30 milliliters of six times more concentrated sulfuric acid than I had to begin with. Now, to test out if it's sulfuric acid, I'm just gonna add some baking soda into it and see if it boils. A pH indicator test would be ineffective because that would detect the presence of all acids, including the carbonic acid, which a little bit might have gotten through. However, baking soda is sodium bicarbonate, and that shouldn't react with carbonic acid. So if this reacts, it implies there is sulfuric acid inside of this. So I'm just gonna pour some of this in and see if it bubbles. And as you can see, there's a bit of bubbles forming. This implies that this stuff is in fact sulfuric acid, or at least a little bit of it. And that's it for this video. No conclusion, see ya.